productiveness. Why is productiveness a virtue? And, and we might as well review for a second. What makes a virtue a virtue? Why are, why are these things that we're articulating uh, virtues? Well, the first one was easy in a sense, right? Because the first one was that which is required for human survival. It's required, and we can see that. It, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say it's obvious, but it's, once you think about it, the thing that is required for human beings to survive is to think. It's to be rational. It's to use one's reason. So the first virtue is directly comes from reality, directly comes from the nature of man. It directly comes from the fact that we do not have automatically programmed in us the ability to survive, the knowledge of what to do, as in a sense other animals do. We have to discover it. We have to think. We have to use our mind. That is why rationality is the first virtue and as well and and really the integrating virtue in a sense the only virtue everything else is an application of but we'll see that when we talk about pride we'll also talk about what 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 Ayn Rand calls the unity of the virtues maybe it's Leonard Peikoff actually talks about it um, I, I can't share if it's a, if if Ayn Rand directly talks about the unity of the virtues, but uh, certainly Leonard does. Um, that the unity of the virtues, they're all basically united around this idea of, of rationality. Now, every one of the virtues is a principle to guide our actions in pursuit of our life. And every one of them is an important, essential application of the virtue of rationality. So honesty, well, you have to be honest to be rational. Independence, well, there is nobody else to do the thinking. You're it. And to do good thinking, you have to do it yourself. Every one of them is an application in that sense. Now, productiveness is more an application of rationality because it's not enough to think it's not enough to think as Kelsey mentions Leonard Peikoff's course unity in ethics and epistemology which is another one of the kind of required uh, lecture courses for anybody who really wants to dig deep into the objectivist ethics or into the objectivist philosophy uh, there are a lot of those Leonard Peikoff courses that are required, um, and, and they're all gems, they're all fun, they're all deep, they're all really, really important and, and, and worth listening to. But again, unity in ethics and epistemology is this idea that it's all one. It's all about man's life, and it's all about survival and happiness, and it's all about being rational. But to think is not enough. We're not beings that can uh, move the world from, just from our thoughts. Action is required. To act based on those thoughts in order to survive is to be productive. And in order to survive the kind of action we must engage in, is the production of material values. We're a material being in a material world which requires material values to survive. The very basics from food, clothing, shelter, Ferraris, you know, all the material, iPhones, obviously, all the material values that are necessary for human survival, for human flourishing, for human happiness. So productiveness is the recognition that we must use our mind to create the material values 
necessary for us to survive. That those material values are not given. You remember a few shows ago, I talked about the Garden of Eden, right? In the Garden of Eden, all the material values necessary for human survival just are there. They just appear. No effort, no work, no thought, therefore, is actually needed in order to produce the material values necessary for human survival. And arguably, Adam and Eve are not human. Is this, uh, I wonder if this is sacrilegious, and I'm now an apostate. Um, Adam and Eve are not human. If what makes human being human is their rational faculty, in a sense of what makes human beings human is the need to think and produce in order to survive, then Adam and Eve are not human until they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Think about Marx's utopia. In Marx's utopia, we go back to the Garden of Eden. In Marx's utopia, no effort is required, no thought is required for all of your needs to be met. They're just met. It's a completely mystical place. So it's sad because it seems like the Judeo-Christian tradition through the Garden of Eden myth, then embedded into Marxism, have implanted in our culture a certain mythology that says that the ideal for human beings is that condition where you don't have to think, you don't have to work, you don't have to produce, productiveness is not necessary, the stuff you need in order to survive, to thrive, to live as a human being is just appears. And therefore we view work as burdensome, thinking as hard and an effort and uh, why do I need to do this? Instead of embracing thinking and working and being productive as the means to a successful, happy, prosperous, flourishing, fulfilling life towards an ideal, indeed viewing thinking and working as an ideal, as the ideal for human beings given their nature, we are set up with a context, with a mythology, with an ideal that is no work, no thinking. Just lay around all day and stuff, you just get your stuff. And you can see that in, in young people who say, why do I have to go to work? I had, I had a kid ask me this question at the University of Texas in Austin last year. Why, why do I need to go to work? I, I want to just pursue my hobbies. I mean, isn't that the promised land? Isn't that the ideal? Isn't the Garden of Eden the ideal? And this is why, in many respects, communism is a secularization of Christianity. And this is why, in many respects, communism, uh, sorry, uh, Marxism and Christianity, and Judaism, because it really comes from Judaism, precondition us, in a sense, culturally, to have a very negative attitude towards being productive, towards work, towards this world. I mean, in, in, do you think anybody goes to work in heaven? Do you think anybody has to be productive in heaven? Is there a profit motive in heaven? No, we're told. Heaven is a return to the Garden of Eden. That is the ideal condition for mankind. And you can see how dangerous and damaging that is. No. Mankind is a particular being. And this particular being needs, must, has to, both for material reasons and for spiritual reasons, has to work. Has to be productive. Has to engage in the activity that shapes his environment to fit his needs. So in, in Opa, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand by Lena Peikoff, 
the subheading under productiveness is productiveness as the adjustment of nature to man. That's a great formulation. Productiveness as the adjustment of nature to man. As we talked about when we talked about rationality, man is not born with the knowledge, with the ability to know automatically what to do, how to do it, how to survive. Not only when we discover the knowledge, but he must also change his environment to fit his needs. Other animals, other animals are adapted to an environment through evolution. And if that environment changes, if it changes dramatically enough, they die out. They die out. Human beings don't die out. This is the whole point about, you know, the panic about climate change. We don't die out. We change our environment to fit our needs. If things get warm, we invent air conditioning. If oceans rise, we build dikes. If things get cold, we come up with fire or burning natural gas, electricity. We change our environment to fit our needs. We adapt through the productive process. We don't just sit back and let the environment dictate our lives. We change it. And therefore, we cannot hold the environment as it is, as some kind of given, a, a kind of static thing. No, the environment is there for us to use for the purpose of our survival. And notice that this completely turns around, upside down, the environmentalist claim that there's an environment out there, it's the good, it's pristine, or staying pristine is the good, and we must adapt to it. So if what we're doing makes it warmer, we should stop doing that. Well, maybe, maybe we should do something else to offset what we're doing, or maybe we should just adapt to the fact that it's going to be warmer. I mean, there's a lot of options. But they take for granted that Nature, the environment, Mother Earth, however you want to call it, is the good. And just like any other animal, if it changes, we're just supposed to roll over and die. No. So, productiveness is the recognition that we must work to create physical values. And the work that is required to create physical values involves changing our environment to fit our needs. Changing our environment to fit our needs. Everything, everything we need, from clothes to shelter, requires changing the environment, whether it's killing animals and, and, um, and skinning them to use their skin, which requires knowledge, by the way. You try it sometime. Kill an animal and skin it. Both those require skill, which requires thought, which requires effort, which requires you know, tools, weapons, strategies, all things of the mind. So every... Every material values requires thinking, requires action, requires effort. The values that are required for our survival as a species, as individuals, have to be conceived before they create, and, and then they have to be created. Somebody has to think of them, and somebody has to act to make them a reality. Think and make it a reality. That's what productiveness is. Productiveness is the process of making them a reality. To buck, productiveness is the process, this is the definition, of creating material values, whether goods or services. Right. 
Uh, Andrew says, objectivism's connection of productivity to morality is integral to making life a spiritual experience. Well, yes. Productiveness, I would say, is necessary to making life a spiritual experience because I think we get our spiritual values from the purpose we have, and we'll get to purpose is connected directly to productiveness. Purpose, our central purpose is going to be our productive purpose. Um, and notice that how unique objectivism is in making productiveness a virtue. I mean, uh, other ethical systems, yeah, you got to go to work, you got you know, you got to make a living, you, you know, maybe personal responsibility. But there's no emphasis on this idea of using a mind to change reality, to create the values necessary for human production. And this is why. Objectivism is so unique in its view of the producer. Its view of the producer. Objectivism views the producer as, in his actions as a producer, moral and good. Because he is producing, he's creating material values necessary for his and our survival. So we know that to be a producer requires knowledge, requires thinking, requires action, requires the creation of something new. Right? Productiveness is defined as the creation of material values. And you have to create, you have to think, you have to imagine, you have to then have a plan, you have to actually put the resources together. It's, it's not obvious. Right. So it's not enough. Somebody asked um, early on, somebody asked, not in the super chat, he said, is listening to your own book show a productive activity? Only if you turn it into action. Only if you apply it to your own life and apply it to how you live and apply the knowledge you get from it to your own life. Otherwise, it's just entertainment. If it's just listening and enjoying it and, or, or learning for the sake of learning. But there is no learning for the sake of learning. Knowledge is to be applied. It's to be productive. Knowledge must be applied in, one, in some way. To, to some way to make your life better. Okay. <laughs> so, for objectivism... You know, a scientist is productive when he takes his discoveries and writes them down and publishes a book. But the fact that he's a scientist doesn't make him more productive than the person that takes his, his scientific discovery and turns it into, call it a gadget. Well, Leonard calls it a gadget. There's no dichotomy between pure science and its products the gadgets, the tools, the technology, the things that we use it for. Right? The purpose of knowledge is a better life, and a better life is achieved by, through partially at least, through material values. And here I, I consider material values also, I mean, music is material, right? It, it needs to be, I mean, somebody having a tune in his head is not productive. He has to play it. And in the modern era, turn it into a record or CD or stream it. That's when it becomes productive. Of course, 
So subjectivism unique among all moral codes. Productive ability as such, as such, deserves the highest accolades. And this is why, putting aside everything else, I'm such a fan of Silicon Valley. Because it is a place of immense productive achievement, productive ability. They produce values, which I benefit from, but even if I don't, somebody is benefiting from, and these people are living the life. Because what is the life? The life is a life of value production. You cannot be happy. You cannot make a happy life without being engaged in some form of productive activity, in some form of using your knowledge, using your mind for your own betterment. So productive ability is a value by the standard of man's life, Leonard Peikoff writes. And because, like all values, a course of virtue is required in order to gain and keep it. And what is the course to gain and keep productive ability? Well, it's knowledge and development of skill. It's having ideas and then putting them into practice. You have to acquire, you have to use all, right? All through a volitional process. You have to be committed to reality. I mean, I imagine you have great ideas and it's completely detached from the real world. And, and you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to be able to produce anything. You're not going to be able to create any kind of values. It's going to be completely detached and floating. And think about all the virtues that we've talked about, right? Reason, independence, honesty. All of those have to be there, have to be applied if you're going to be productive. You're not going to create any values if you're not rational. If you can't think, if you refuse to think, if you evade. If you go by your emotions, nothing gets produced. How are you going to produce if you're constantly worried about other people and what they think, if you're not independent, if you're a second-hander? I mean, there's no iPhone if Steve Jobs is a second-hander. There's no anything of value. Nothing of value is built. No progress is made from somebody who is not an independent thinker, who, who is completely dependent on others. You have to be in focus. You have to think. You have to be independent. And, of course, you must be honest. Garbage in, garbage out. We talked about this. And if... You're going to create something that's not garbage. You better be honest with yourself. You better be focused on facts. You better be focused on reality. You better not be just floating out there, detached from all of that. Every job, every work engages the human mind if you choose to engage. And if you want to do a good job, you're going to have to engage your mind. fact is, particularly in the modern world, there's very little work that actually requires pure physical labor. Most of it requires mental labor, and some requires physical labor, but is enhanced if you think about it and you discover better ways to do it. Now, because productive work requires the application of all the other virtues, by the way, justice is huge in productive work particularly if you work with other people. But even if you don't, even if you're an independent, who do you take on as a client? You have to judge people. You have to come to conclusions about them. Who is worthy as a client? Who's worthy as an employee? 
who's worthy as a boss? How should you judge your coworkers? Who should do what? Constantly, every aspect of productive activity requires the application of every one of the other virtues. This is what makes it so important. This is what makes it spiritually required for happiness and for having a complete life. Not only does it provide you with the knowledge that you can take care of yourself, the knowledge that you can supply the things that are necessary for you to survive and to thrive, the material requirements of your own life, but it also engages you in all the activities that are life enhancing. Focus, thinking, independence, honesty, justice. You have to engage with all the virtues all the time. It is intense, it is demanding, it is requires massive effort. And that's why it's so central to human life. All right. So You know, for um, the virtues are geared ultimately towards our values, reason, purpose, self-esteem. And all the virtues are geared to all the values. So it's not like a one-to-one -one relationship, the, the seven virtues, the three values. All of them, all of them are, are, are directly related. But if you think about productiveness, Productiveness is directly related to purpose. Why? Now, I did a whole show on purpose. I encourage you to go and review that show if you're interested in this. But purpose is, is, is a requirement for human life. We, we, we need a reason for this value versus that value. Why this value? There has to be a purpose for what we're doing. Otherwise, we're just drifting. We, we, we have no clue. This value, that value. We have to have a hierarchy of values. We have to build a hierarchy of values. And for that, there has to be a purpose to all of these values. There has to be a goal, something we're trying to achieve with this. And to achieve that integration, to achieve the integration of all your values into a hierarchy, and a hierarchy means priorities. What's more important than what? What would I rather do than this other thing? How do I choose between A and B? Well, how do they fit into my hierarchy? But how do I create a hierarchy? And it's too broad and floating and abstract to say, create it based on happiness. It's too removed. Happiness is the effect. Or survival. Survival, how... What, you know, to, so you need a, a central purpose. You need something that will integrate all these other v values so that you can prioritize based on the central purpose. It's not the only purpose. It's not in all contexts the overarching, the, the, the overruling purpose, but it's the integrating purpose. You don't want things that conflict with it. And what can serve as a central purpose? What can serve as such a massive integration? Well, there really is only one activity that we engage in, and that is our productive activity. Because it engages all the other virtues, because it requires so much focus and energy and time, and because it requires so much energy and focus and time, we want to choose it based on what we love doing, what we enjoy doing, what we get satisfaction from doing. It's so career, your work, your productive activity, 
become your integrating central purpose. Become the most important thing that you do. I mean, the fact is, you know, even in the culture, people say, oh, most important thing to me is family or many other things. But the fact is that they spend most of their time working. So in terms of their choice in how to spend their time, they're telling you that working is more important to them. You know, everybody can probably work less and still do fine. We live in a pretty rich society. But people want to get richer because they want to pursue more values. They want to get richer because the wealth is an indication a sign from reality that you are actually being productive. I think that's pr primarily why very wealthy people continue to work for money because working for money continues to give them an indication that they are producing values. If they stop working for money, how do they know if what they're producing is valuable? How do you measure that? Well, the best measure of value in that context is money. It's not that they're going to consume it. Some of them are because they're going to go to Mars, but most of them are not. Most of it, it's a sign. It's a symbol. It's an indication from reality that they are being productive. So your central purpose is your career. Your central purpose is the work that you do. And work that you do is not just work. It shouldn't be just work. You should love it. You should find something that you love. And you should spend most of your focused energy on it. You should have long-term plans with regard to it. It should be a career. Now, some people's career is not like that. Let's say you're an artist, and to do the art, you have to do things on the side. You have to work as a waiter or whatever. And then it's work, and then your real career is this other thing, right? But for most of us, our career is our productive activity, is our work. And to be happy, to be truly happy as a human being, you need to be creative. I mean, you need to create, not be creative in the, in the sense, artistic sense, but you need to create, you need to make, build something. You need to have that, that productive activity. Be your central purpose. You need to enjoy it, thrive in it. I mean, that doesn't mean it's not hard, by the way. The fact that you enjoy it doesn't mean it's not hard. doesn't mean it's not agonizing sometimes. doesn't mean it's not difficult. All of those things can be true. But it still should excite you. It still should thrill you, and it, 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 it still, when you're successful, should be one of the best feelings in the world. Think of Riordan and Alice Shrug. Think of the pain, the suffering, the difficulty, the hardship of discovering Riordan metal, of creating Riordan metal. It's not discovered, it's created. But the satisfaction, the deep, deep, satisfaction that comes from actually achieving it and the value or purpose that that gave him and the self-esteem that that provided him. And of course, the only way he could get it is by using his mind. So he achieved all three of the values, reason, purpose, and self-esteem, in that one activity. And that's what a good job should do. It should engage your mind, give you a central purpose, and provide you with a boost, a constant, ongoing boost to your self-esteem. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence. 
and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at yourownbookshow.com slash support, or on Patreon, or Subscribestar, or Locals, uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value, hopefully, you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.